Hare Krishna. So today we come to the concluding part of our discussion on the comparison of Ramayana and the Mahabharata, uh, Ram Lila and Krishna Lila. And we're focusing on the theme of how do, when bad things happen to good people, how do good people respond to that? In the first session, I talked about how when bad things happen, there can be multiple causes for that. And in the morning session, I talked about three broad factors. There's, there is God's will, there is free will, and there is evil. And then we concluded by how, how do we respond? There are two forms of surrender. That is either by dependence on the Lord or diligence for the Lord. So today I'll take this forward and we'll look at how issues are resolved. So if you consider the Ramayana, eventually there has, the, in one sense, there's a difference between the nature of the war in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. In the Ramayana, it is Kaikai who is the cause of the exile. But there is no war over there. There's another person who comes in the picture, that is Ravana. And while Ram, while Ram, Lakshman and Sita are in the forest, he abducts Sita and then there is a war between them. Whereas in the case of the Mahabharat, it is the Kauravas who have conspired and had the Pandavas banished. And after that, it is the war is with those same people who have exiled them. It's, there are many, many characters in the Mahabharat, but overall the storyline is that it's the same characters who are confused. We see on one side in the Ramayana, there is reconciliation at the end between a reunion and reconciliation and Ram and Lakshman Sita come back. All the people are welcoming them. Kaikai is also there. And of course, Bharat is there to welcome. So there is confrontation, but there is also reconciliation. On the other hand, if we see, in the case of the Ramayana, there is confrontation between Ram and, between Ram and Ravana. There also, what happens is, it's Vivekan who is enthroned as the king after that. Now, if you consider the Mahabharat, there is a confrontation between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. And after that, we have Yudhishthir who becomes the king. And still, Dhritarashtra continues to have a position of respect and honor. So I talked earlier about how there is weakness and wickedness. And depending on weakness, we can have forgiveness. But in respect to wickedness, there has to be justice. There has to be punishment at times. So with that background, let's look at some salient incidents in the final battle that illustrate some principles about how Hare Krishna, about how we can move on in our lives amid distress. So life is tough and there are times when we have to confront. When we confront someone, it's not pleasant. In fact, even uh, uh, intense verbal conversation between people. So that is also a confrontation. And in that confrontation, there are, we can say that there's a continuous reincarnation that is happening. I have certain ideas. Oh, this is like this. And so if I'm really listening to the other person, the other person will say something, oh, I thought it's like this, but now I'm saying it's like this. So basically what has happened? It's a conception of the same thing, but the conception of that thing has changed. So it's a, like I say, a soul remains the same, but the body changes. So like that, a good conversation, it has a certain con aspect of confrontation. And the confrontation, there is reincarnation. Reincarnation of ideas. Reincarnation of conceptions. Oh, I thought it like this, but now I understand it like this. So basically, most of us may not have uh, physical confrontations where we don't have to fight wars. Most of us are not Kshatriyas. 
but we all have verbal confrontations. And even if we don't have verbal confrontations, we can say there is always confrontation between our conceptions and reality. And then sometimes we can get, we can mold reality according to our conceptions. And sometimes reality remolds our conceptions. So we all, there is confrontation constantly in life. Again, if we look at the microscopic level constantly, there are microbes, there are germs that are attacking our body. And there are the defender cells, the WB, the viral corpus, because they're defending our body. So the whole body itself is constantly a battle zone. And constantly, similarly, at every level in the universe, there is confrontation. So there's confrontation between various aspects and sometimes in the universe there is there is physical confrontation. So the Ramayana and the Mahabharata they depict the physical confrontation. That's of course historical, that's of course uh, devastating and destructive. But at the same time it is also reflective of what happens throughout history at various levels. So now when we are facing difficulties in our lives. At that time, broadly speaking, uh, we are, say, in a disempowering situation. There's some, some situation which is comfortable for us that has changed and we don't seem to have the power to change that. So, or at least we, we can't immediately change it. So, for example, Ram, he changed the situation of Sita having been abducted by winning the war and getting Sita back. But he couldn't change the situation by changing Ravan's heart. He, there was repeated warnings and demonstrations of power, but nothing worked for Ravan. The Hanuman burned Lanka, Angad gave a warning, Vibhishan gave a warning. I'm writing a new book on the Ramayana. I talk about how Ravan had 10 heads, but zero brains. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, 10 people gave him warnings that you know, don't confront Ram, it will cause you destruction. But all of these 10 people gave, not one of them he listened to. So, although at one level Ram won the war by and gave Sita back, there were some battles which just can't be won. Ravan was too attached to his conceptions and he couldn't give it up. So he gave up his life, but he did not give up his conception that I may enjoy. That I, I want to possess and enjoy Sita. On the other hand, we see the something similar happens to Duryodhan. The, the, the Pandavas fight a battle and eventually the Kauravas have to be killed. But then what happens? Eventually Vidura fights another battle with Dhritarashtra. That is a verbal battle. And in that, he is able to enlighten Dhritarashtra. That means what? He is able to change Dhritarashtra. Change Dhritarashtra's heart. But the point is that there are different ways to fight battles and there are different victories in different battles. So each battle will have a different definition of victory. And generally, when discussions stop, sometimes if we have discussions with people, then sometimes there are confrontations, there are quarrels, and we say, just let's stop discussion. It's fine if two people can work separately, but sometimes by that misunderstanding go further. So misunderstanding go further. So we have to find out what is the best way to move on. Sometimes just two people going away and keeping each of them gets their space and they do what they want to do. That may work, but sometimes two people going away means if both of the see, sometimes you say out of sight is out of mind. That is true if the mind is out of it. Sometimes what happens is <laughs> out of sight is out of mind. Sorry, out of out of sight is out of mind when the mind is out of it. If the mind is still in it, then we are still replaying it and still we are increasing our anger and resentment. And that is quite hurtful. So here we are generalizing this principle that when there are when there are 
issues and there will be new issues. Sometimes confrontation is required for that. Now when confrontation is required, what do we do? How do we move forward? See, basically for every one of us, we need a sense of purpose and a sense of focus. These are fundamental human needs. We talk about food, clothing, shelter, or air, water. Yeah, they are all important. But along with these, at a, these are not physical needs. At a metaphysical level, even if somebody says, I, I don't believe in any philosophy. People who say, I don't believe in any philosophy. They are following a philosophy. <laughs> philosophy is the sophistry of fools. Sophistry is false arguments. Everybody has a philosophy. Nobody can say that I don't have a philosophy. It's just that some people have not thought about their philosophy. Even if somebody says, you know, I only, I don't worry about any other world. I only focus on the here and now. I enjoy what is here and now. That's a philosophy. That's a, philo that's a philosophy of materialism. That the here and now is what matters. And is that necessarily true? That's, that's open to question. So everybody has some philosophy which guides them. So basically we all need in our life a sense of purpose. Okay, this is the direction I'm going to. And we need a sense of progress. That I am able to move in this direction. Now what is this? What is the sense of purpose? Say for example a student is studying. And the student is told, okay you are in grade 1 now. And you study for the next 15 years, and you will stay in grade 1 for the next 15 years. Then why should I study then? I want to study because I want to move in a particular direction. There is purpose and progress. These two are vital. So, if we face a situation where, now we all have set up certain purposes for our life. The purpose might be, okay, I want to grow financially. I might want to grow in terms of my relationships. I want to grow in terms of improve my health. I want to grow spiritually. I want to do this service more. We all have certain purposes in our life. And we feel our life is on, the, on track when we have a purpose and we are able to progress in that purpose. Now, of course, it's not just, you know, different people have different purposes. But what we want is a purpose that is meaningful for us. If somebody says, the purpose of my life is, okay, I've got this vacation, and in this vacation, every day I'm going to watch six movies. Well, okay, you can do that. But after some time, you just get bored of it. That's not a very meaningful purpose. So what we want in life is some purpose now what is very meaningful. That is something which is important for us, something which makes us feel that our life is valuable. This is important to understand that, that ultimately all insecurity it boils down to one point that does my existence matter at all? Does my existence and does my endeavor matter at all? So when whatever we are doing. At least, then is it going to make any difference to anyone? Is it going to matter? And we need that. Sometimes people feel I have low self-esteem, I have inferiority complex, I have depression. Now, all of these can have various causes. But ultimately, it boils down to a feeling that nothing matters. Whatever I do, nothing is going to matter. And even my existence doesn't matter. So there are, we can, life can put us through various losses. Um, in the previous session I talked about you know, what we live with and what we live for. What we live with are our resources. What we live for is our purposes. Now of course the resources and purposes are related. Right? Say if I want to go to a particular destination, I have a car. I drive to this destination. So the car is the resource and the destination where I want to go is the purpose. So we all set up certain purposes for us. So if, say, Ram's purpose is that work, if suppose Ram's purpose is that I want to become the king of all people, and then he's exiled, then this is terrible. This is 
this is unjust. What's this? Why this happening? So what happens is when we set up sort of purposes, sometimes situations can completely thwart those purposes. And when that purpose is thwarted, what do we do with that thing? So if now if we consider Duryodhan, his purpose was constantly that I want to I want to be the Guru King. And it's interesting, he didn't just want to be the Guru King. In the sense, the Drashtra was the Guru King and he would also become the Guru King. If we want to be happy, it's possible to be happy. But we want to be happier than others. <laughs> and that is impossible. So, what happened was, the Drashtra, sorry, the real man, he, he was prosperous. Guru Kingdom was not a poor, poor kingdom. But then he saw the Rajas Vijayapati, where, where Yudhishthira had far greater prosperity. He said, how can I live like this? How can I, how can I, his, his argument was that, how can any self-respecting person be happy when his rival is more prosperous than him? That is a very, very disempowering definition or foundation for one's happiness. I have to be happier than someone else. So now we see uh, when Ram, when he, he, his purpose at one level is not to become the king. You see, his purpose was, I want to serve my father. As a service to my father, I'll become a king. As a service to my father, I'm ready to go to the forest. The Pandavas, their purpose, even when they wished to perform the Rajasuri Yagya, it was to serve Krishna. That they be, they should become the emperor and then he offered the Agra Puja to Krishna. And that's how he was able to perceive it. That, that, that's what, that was his purpose. That we want Krishna to be glorified. So we all can have many specific purposes in our life. And we all want to pursue our purposes. But sometimes some purposes just get thwarted. And when a purpose gets thwarted, what do we do at that time? Either we keep we keep struggling, struggling, I do this. Or then we see that this purpose is a part of something bigger. What do I mean by something bigger? That yes, we we all have if we consider the standard example that the Bhagavatam gives us, that Kunti Maharani prays, <coughs> that let my consciousness flow towards you as the Ganga flows towards the ocean. Doi anai vishaya mati madhu pate sakhai prati vahata dagdha gange vau gangai mati It's one of the last prayers that she offers. She says, that let my consciousness not go anywhere else. Let it go only towards me, Baba. And before, this is, this is, before that, there is that incredible verse where she says that let calamities come more and more. Because then we can remember you more and more. We can see you more and more. So the idea is for her, if we consider our various purposes, they are like tributaries for a river. The water stream is flowing in it. And if a river is flowing from mountain down, and at that time, there were different tributaries. One flows this path, one flows another path, one flows another path. And ultimately, the river is meant to go to the ocean. And for the river, if one particular path gets blocked, it finds another path. It finds another path. It finds another path. Or sometimes it may just keep pushing, pushing, and in the path it gets erodes, and then the obstacle erodes, and it moves on. But the point is that for us, if we understand the principles of bhakti and uh, our shastra properly, we understand our ultimate purpose is to get our consciousness to flow towards the Lord. We that ultimately our purpose is to connect with Krishna, to learn to love Krishna. And everything we are doing is for that purpose. If we have, now we will have many other purposes, but if those purposes become our foremost purpose, 
and then that purpose is thwarted, then what am I doing? Why am I doing this at all? What should I do now? So we see this this sense of futility is when we function in the world. What happens? It's very easy to get caught in in pursuing a material purpose, even if it is for a spiritual purpose. So if we actually more or less, it's it's amazing how um, the same same set of doubts, emotions, and negativity that Arjuna goes through before the Kurukshetra war, something similar Yudhishthir goes through after the Kurukshetra. Before the Kurukshetra war, I think it's, it's not worth fighting. For a mere kingdom, why should you fight that with these relatives? It's not worth it. He says that Rudeir Pradipta, the spoils of this war will be tainted by blood. It's not worth it. Then Krishna will give them a clear vision. Krishna tells you, Arjuna, you are not fighting this war for simply getting your kingdom. You're fighting the war to establish dharma. And ultimately, dharma is what? To ourselves go closer to Krishna and to help others go closer to Krishna. And it is for this purpose you're fighting. And that's why at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, when Krishna concludes and then Arjuna responds, Arjuna doesn't say, I will fight the war. Arjuna's concluding verses are the following. That is, so his conclusion is, I will rule your way. So he is, in that situation for him, fighting was the way to do Krishna's way. But he was not thinking, I am going to fight. He was thinking, I am going to do Krishna. Now, for Yudhishthir also, something similar happened. And he fought, fought and he won. So that time, the sheer catastrophic cost of the war, then he said, hey, what have I done? Why did I fight so much? What is, what, is, what, is the, what is the value of all this? So when that happened, it is actually Bhishma who persuades and how did Bhishma pursue Yudhishthir? It's this one verse which is uh, which is very puzzling at the same time revealing. So Bhishma Pitama is speaking and he says, Tathakte kant bhakteshu pashya gopanu kampitam yanne sutta jita sakshat krishna darshanam agataha So he says, Therefore, Tathak e kant bhakteshu that I am an unto all, unto all, unflinching devotee. It's for the unflinching devotee, just see. Pashya Gopanu Kampitam. Just see how great is the mercy of the Lord. What is the mercy? Yannesyus Tejata Sakshat. When I was about to depart from the world, what has happened? Himself Krishna. Krishna. Krishna has you know, come to give me Darshan. So now there are several interesting points in this verse. First of all, how can Bhishma say that I am a pure devotee, I am an unflinching devotee? Now many devotees say, I am not a devotee at all. There was one American devotee who went to Mayapur. Not, he was not a devotee, he was a young person. He was just interested in spirituality. And he told me one of his experiences that he said that he went to Mayapur and he was there for a few days. And there was some very senior Prabhupada said, a very old lady devotee. She said, actually, you are a devotee. You just, you just don't know you are a devotee. <laughs> and then after she told me, actually, I am not a devotee. I am struggling to become a devotee. So what is happening? Somebody who is a devotee, they think I am not a devotee. And somebody is not a devotee, you're saying they're a devotee. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, there is humility and there is, a, there is a spiritual vision of reality. So, the point is that as a devotee, we don't think I'm a devotee. 
and we see everybody has the potential to love Krishna, in that sense everybody is potentially a devotee. But how can the devotee say that I am, I am, because I am an unflinching devotee, I am, I am such an unalloyed devotee, I am an unflinching devotee. One-pointed devotee. So here, Vishnu Pitama is actually making some bigger point. His point is that Vishnu also actually had a very difficult service. He had to fight against Krishna. And Krishna from within the heart inspired him to do that. And he did that in a mood of service to the Lord. So because, so he's saying, sometimes the situations that we are put in are very difficult to deal with. But if we stay unflinching in our devotion, eventually the Lord will reward us. And who can just see the reward I am giving? That I have the Lord in front of me. So he's not saying that I am such a great devotee. But his, his point is, he's telling Yudhishthir that you also be an unflinching devotee. Although you may feel that, my God, so much bloodshed, why should I think, that, think of this fear? But I am acting for this fear. So the point is that both, Krishna, both Arjuna and Yudhishthir, they are told that you fight not just for winning the war or ruling the kingdom or being the king, you fight for serving the Lord. For establishing the kingdom. So, in general, when we face a big problem, the, the best way to face a big problem is to find a purpose bigger than the problem. A purpose bigger than the problem. So, if my purpose is is, say, to be, if my purpose is that I should be considered to be a great preacher. Now, if that is my purpose, then sometimes, sometimes people may appreciate, sometimes people may not appreciate. And then I'll feel frustrated. Now, of course, if we are doing a particular service, we want the result at an external level also. But if that alone is our purpose, sometimes we miss what? But the purpose bigger than the problem means that Actually, if my purpose is to purify my heart, I want to speak about Krishna, I want to purify my heart. My purpose is to, to uh, increase my bhakti for Krishna. Then, when we have a purpose bigger than the problem, then we can persevere through the problem. So, if the problem is so big and we feel this problem has completely thwarted my purpose, then we just can't persevere. So, Shri Prabhupada once told his disciples that one my godbrothers went to London. You know why I came to America? Why I came to New York? So now there could be different answers to this. At one level, after the Second World War, the, the fortunes of Great Britain dwindled considerably. Great Britain basically became small Britain. <laughs> <laughs> At one time, it was said that the great, uh, UK is a place where the, the, um, the sun never sets, sets on the British Empire. When Prabhupada went to London, Prabhupada would go for morning walks in London. Prabhupada said, the sun never rises here. <laughs> <laughs> so at one level, the geopolitical order of the world had changed. And America was least affected by the Second World War. Because there was no direct war on American territory. And everybody was affected. And America became a superpower after that. So the global center of influence shifted from UK to America. That's one reason. But Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada also gave another reason. Prabhupada said that I felt that my god brothers went to London and to, to fulfill the instruction of SVG Master. They couldn't succeed. So he said, if I am going to, if I am also going to fail, let me at least fail at trying at some other place. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prabhupada's purpose was, he was ready. Okay, I may not succeed. But Prabhupada, his purpose was, I want to fulfill the instruction of the spirit master. The spirit master's instruction was, go and preach in the rest of the world. And it was not that you build a temple, it was not that you make hundreds of devotees, it was not that you do those results. He said, go and preach. Go and preach in the rest of the world. So, 
Prabhupada at one level was very determined, at another level, at one level Prabhupada was very firm, at another level Prabhupada was very flexible. Firm in his purpose. And I want to share Krishna with you. But flexible in terms of how do I go about doing this? Initially, he was in Butler, and there, as in the YMCA, some talks were organized. But there, people treated Prabhupada more like a curiosity object rather than a spiritual teacher. <laughs> and Prabhupada sized it up with him. He said, There's no point. Then he went to a university and he gave a talk over there. And there it was okay, but people were, had a more academic interest in it. Then Prabhupada got an opportunity to go to New York, and he came to New York. And there, also, initially, he was just told, You can do Kirtan, you cannot give classes. So Prabhupada was doing Kirtan, but through that he met some people and they said, Come, you come to the Lower East Side. And then he came there and he was basically Prabhupada was exploring it. Now, Prabhupada tried many, many things, but his purpose was to share Krishna's message. And as far as the path, it was flexible. If this works, good. If this doesn't work, let's try that. If this doesn't work, try that. So if Prabhupada had been, say, uh, fixated on Starting the League of Devotees in India, in Jhasi. It was not working, not working. Say, yeah, I tried it, it didn't work, let me give it up. It was not working. So Prabhupada faced many, many problems. But his purpose was bigger than those problems. This, see, when we talk about a problem, what do we mean? In general, problem means that we have, we have a, let's say there's a purpose and there's a path. A purpose is more like a direction. A path is like a road in that direction. So whenever we talk about problems, problems generally are about obstacles on a path. But the tendency in the material world is that we start equating the path with the purpose. I have to go here and I have to go this way. If I can't go this way, I am blocked. So Prabhupada never let himself get blocked like that. Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, try many things. This didn't work. This, this didn't work. Let's, let's try this. And then many things didn't work, and then at the end of his life, many things worked. So for us, when we are when we are facing problems, whatever problem it is, it means that we are we want to go along a particular path, and there is an obstacle on that path, which we may not be able to resolve. It may be a relational obstacle, it may be a health obstacle, it may be a financial obstacle. It may also be an obstacle in terms of maybe some impurity in our own heart. We want to remove it and we are not able to remove it. So whichever obstacle it is, it's important that our purpose not be centered only on removing that obstacle. Okay, this is the direction I want to go. If I can't go by this path, how can I keep moving forward? How can I keep moving forward? So oh, that means that when Dhishthir was so despondent, I was supposed to protect all these little things. And just to make myself the king, I caused the death of so many people. How can you king of this? How can I be overthinking this kind of thing? So Krishna, through Bhishma, raised this consciousness. Your purpose is not to be a king. Your purpose is to establish that. And these are the people who are surviving, established Dharma over here. Yeah, they need you. And when he saw, the purpose is not to become a king, the purpose is something bigger than becoming a king. In today's world, uh, many people who live according to what you can call as nihilism. Nihilism is basically life has no meaning, life has no purpose. This is a prominent Western philosopher, Albert Camus. He said that life is meaningless and life is miserable. Therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote many books. And his idea is don't commit suicide today. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, without any without any spiritual understanding, ultimately the big picture, say I work so hard, I try to achieve this, I try to achieve that, and some storm comes in my life and everything gets destroyed. What is the point of doing all this? 
The point is that for everything that we do, there is an external reflector, which we all want. When we are giving a class, we uh, want that people should appreciate, people should uh, not just appreciate, also appreciate the message we are giving and people should grow in Krishna consciousness. If we are doing, say, if you're parents, you're taking care of our children, we want our children to grow up into good human beings, good devotees. That's the purpose. So, that, so all these are important purposes, but the external purpose is not the only purpose. We're ultimately doing everything to, to in a mood of service to Krishna, to connect with Krishna. And in many situations, the external result and the internal result, they both come together. And in some situations, we may have, the, we may not get the external result no matter what we do. So at that time, we have to look for the internal result. Yes, in, I'm doing this. In this particular case, result is not coming. So what do I do? Then my ultimate purpose is to serve, serve the Lord. Now that doesn't necessarily mean I just keep doing the thing. Sometimes it's a due obligation, we do it. Sometimes we okay, this is not working, let's try something else. But we don't get fixated with the external result. We don't get fixated with the with trying to remove the external obstacle. And when we have this vision, then we can keep moving forward in all these situations. So I started by talking about purpose and progress. Uh, that we all need this. Okay, I'm moving. So sometimes the external result is not coming at all. Then why am I doing all this? Well, the external result is not coming. Maybe you have to try some other path to get the external, some external result. And more important, even if the external, external result is not coming, the internal result is still coming. That is, in that inner growth, that inner connection with Krishna, that's always happening. And why are we going through all this? I will uh, make one more point, then I'll conclude and you can have questions. I said in the previous session that when we are having distress, we can have broadly three different conceptions of Krishna. Krishna is the cause of the difficulty, Krishna is the cause of the distress, Krishna is the comforter amid the distress, and Krishna is the cure for the distress. And now, in general, I talk that we cannot simplistically say that everything, all everything that happens is God's doing. It's not that God is causing everything. Sometimes bad things happen in life, and that's just the way life is. So, it's uh, now in the, in the Bhishma pastime, what is Tasyanu Vidita Rajan? Tasyanu Vidita Rajan in Bhishma says, the Prabhupada translates very beautiful that it, it, so he doesn't say that everything is the Lord's plan. He says, everything is within the Lord's plan. And what is the difference between everything is the Lord's plan and everything is within the Lord's plan? It's like, say, we are driving to a particular place and we're using GPS. And the GPS says, turn left. And we turn right. And what does the GPS do? It's like, we do. We three rounds. And then tells the GPS, you didn't obey me, get lost. <laughs> the GPS doesn't do that. So, why, even if we had turned right, even the right turn and the path, GPS has already mapped that out. And from there, GPS will create a path for us and we move. So, so, so Krishna is the ultimate GPS. And we could say there's a path for our life. But sometimes we take a long, wrong turn. And then because of our own impurities, because of our misuse of free will, or sometimes evil people come in our way, or some past karma comes in our way, and then we can't go along that. We turn it. So now everything is not necessarily God's plan. If we if if uh, if we make some terrible mistake, or somebody else makes some terrible mistake, or somebody does something evil, all that is not God's plan. That is there is a wrong turn to the road of life. But everything is within the Lord's plan. That is, even if we take a wrong turn, still Krishna can get us moving in the right direction. Every long term will have consequences, no doubt. It will take time to get to the right decision if I take a long term. But no wrong turn will mean that we are going to, we can no longer come back. We are, that we have got out of Krishna's plan. We are still within Krishna's plan. So, I talk about the cause, the comforter and the cure. So sometimes, if we start thinking that, is Krishna a 
Okay, the cerebral thing that is happening in my head, is Krishna doing this? Well, it is very difficult to know that. Ultimately, Krishna is, Krishna's purpose ultimately is to help us to come towards. Specifically, when somebody is doing something, is Krishna doing it? I don't know. It's very difficult to know. For some people, it might be favorable. Religion. What? This, this, this stuff is coming in my life. Krishna is telling me. Let me just become detached from this or focus on me or whatever else. So that if somebody can have that vision and stay favorable to Krishna, that Krishna is doing this for me, for my good. So it's like a surgeon doing some surgery. It's painful, but it's for our good. Sometimes we may have that vision. But it's very difficult when we are going through difficulties, especially when we can see a personal agency for those difficulties. This person is doing like this. Is Krishna doing it or this person abusing their feet? So that cause, it's a little bit difficult for us to figure that out. But sometimes we feel Krishna should be the cure for my difficulty. At least I pray to Krishna and then Krishna removes the problems. So actually Krishna can do that. But that is not necessarily always the way Krishna works. The idea is that in this world, even if Krishna removes one difficulty, another difficulty will come. And Krishna is the cure in the ultimate sense. Krishna is doing that. He, he will cure us in the sense that he will raise our consciousness beyond the world. Krishna says to Arjuna, Mach chitta sarva dargani, Mach prasadat karishisi. If you become conscious of me, I will pass over all obstacles by my grace. Now he says, we'll pass over all obstacles. Krishna is not saying, you will not have any obstacle. He's not saying that I will remove all obstacles. Arjuna faced many, many reversals during the war. Abhmanyu was killed before the Ragartan of Arjuna, Hiravan was killed. And it was extremely painful. But Krishna took him through it. So Krishna is the ultimate cure. It is not necessarily that Krishna is the immediate cure. And sometimes at the immediate level, we may have to do practically some things. And sometimes they may work, sometimes they may not work. If I have got a fracture in my hand, I say, I'll chant Hare Krishna, the fracture will get cured. Well, no, we got a fracture, go to a doctor. We, we don't confuse the, like the previous question you asked like, for science and scientific explanation. They're correct, but they're not complete. So we have to sometimes work at a practical level to cure also. We, the, so we do what we can, but sometimes the material cures don't work. So if we expect Krishna to be the cure, there are two broad possibilities. We think that Krishna will cure the material problem. And we don't do anything to deal with it. Just I'll chant and everything will be all. Well, Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. And that is true. But Prabhupada himself did not just chant Hare Krishna and then down all his best. Prabhupada at the age of 70 alone went to America. Came to America and he endeavored. So when Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna at one level, it is, a, it is specifically chanting. At another level, it also means you know, chanting Hare Krishna is actually glorifying Krishna. And Prabhupada knew what it meant to glorify Krishna. Satatam kirta yanto ma vitantasya tukhavata. Prabhupada was determined to glorify Krishna. So, Prabhupada also did what was required at the material level. Trying this, trying that, trying that. And sometimes something works, sometimes it doesn't work. So, if we see Krishna as the cure for our suffering, sometimes we will be disappointed. Sometimes it may work, sometimes it may not work. But if we see Krishna as our comforter, as our strength amid the suffering, that means we stop expecting that Krishna will magically remove the problem, but that Krishna will give us the strength to deal with the problem. Krishna, the strength primarily is, uh, Sridhar Swami in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita in the 12th chapter, he gives a very interesting purport to this 12.6 and 7. So this 12.6 and 7 is, well, six, Desha, Maham, Bhavamina Chira Partha Maya Vishita Chetasam. So twelve seven he says that Krishna is saying, if you become devoted to me, I will lift you out of the ocean of material existence. I will lift you out. 
and urging her so well to that act. So what does it mean? So Siddhar Swami says he correlates 12, 12, 7 with 10, 10 in the Bhagavad Gita. 10, 10 is Tesha Tadava Yukana Ajatam Preeti Purvakam Tadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayanti Te He says, I will help you rise above the situation. I will give you the intelligence by which you will come to me. So this intelligence is the way Krishna lifts the devotee out of the motivation. Tesham Aham Samudra. So how does Krishna lift us out? It is by giving us the intelligence to transcend the situation. To give us the intelligence by which how we can... It's interesting, what does he say? Dami buddhi yogam tam yena maam upayanti. He is not saying, I will give you the intelligence to solve the problem. I will give you the intelligence to come to me. Sometimes we come to him by solving the problem. Sometimes we come to him by learning to live with the problem. Sometimes we come to him by just leaving the problem. I don't want to get involved in this. Like I said, tolerate, mitigate, integrate, whichever works. But the idea is, Krishna says, I will give you the intelligence to come to me. So now these two, uh, com combine these two. I started by talking about the purpose. Now we need a purpose bigger than the problem. And that we have, the purpose is connecting with Krishna. And then, what is Krishna's role? If Krishna gives us the knowledge by which we can pursue that purpose. I will come to him, we will come closer. That is the purpose, that is the knowledge that Krishna always gives his devotees. And if we have that knowledge, then in all situations, we will be progressing towards that. And we will have problems. It's not possible in this world that there are no that problems go away. But the problems we will be facing will not overwhelm us. We will, as I said, we may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. So that our goal, our, our purpose is not fixated in that particular issue. It is much bigger. The world can hurt us in many ways, but the greater in the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. And if you are looking at the world for the situation to become better, you might just keep getting hurt. But if you turn towards Krishna and Focus on connecting with Krishna, we find that even the most hurtful situations, he has the power to heal us. That's how we can keep moving forward. So in every situation, whether it be comfortable or difficult, we say that my purpose is to connect with Krishna. Krishna, how can I move towards you? How can I, what can I do to serve you in this situation? In this particular role, in this particular responsibility, in this particular service. How can I move closer to you? Then, if we have that service attitude, Krishna will help us move it. Sometimes that way will be, sudden light gets illuminated. Okay, this is what I'm meant to do. Sometimes that way will just take one step forward. Sometimes Krishna's Adami Bhutti Yogam Tam can come like a street light which illumines the whole path. Sometimes that will just come simply as a flashlight. Okay, take this one step forward. Take this one step forward. For Prabhupada, it will be just taking one step forward. Okay, let's try this. Let's try this. Take one step forward. And if we do that, if we take that one step forward, we will gradually find that those dark times that we are going through, those dark times which we will feel when we the end, the dark times sometimes can seem to us to be like a dungeon. But it's not a dungeon, it's a tunnel. And if our focus is on serving Krishna, just keep taking one step, one step, one step forward, gradually you will come out of the tunnel and you will come to a brighter place, a better place, a place that is closer to Krishna. That is ultimately meeting with Krishna in our hearts and eventually see his abode. So I'll summarize. I spoke a little bit about how to persevere, how to have purpose than the idea and how to pursue a political purpose. So I started by talking about all of us, we need a sense of purpose and progress to exist. Where am I going? Am I, am I actually to move towards move in that direction? So without that, we just become completely in this hard predicament. So sometimes we like to just take away that. Just, my, my just heart purpose is purpose. 
So we will have to confront it. We have to fight it in order to win. But who is fighting with us? So Ram fought the battle against Ravan at first, but then he didn't change his conception. And that's what we're talking about. So he fought the battle and he didn't change his conception. So that's what we're talking about. Conceptual battle is more than a physical battle. So even the law, but sometimes we don't even think of it. The point of Krishna himself, when the Shanti did that didn't work, but eventually the Raj took an enlightened level. So the purpose is the confrontation unavoidable. But then if we get attached to a particular, this is the way, this is the battle I want to win. Sometimes our battles are not winnable at all. So we get strength by pursuing a purpose bigger than our problems. And we all set up certain purposes in our life. Purposes are like paths. The, sorry, uh, we, the, the particular uh, things that we set up as goals, they are often the paths. But purpose is much bigger. Purpose is more like a direction. If the Ganga, if it's one, one channel gets blocked, the Ganga finds another channel to continue to work. So like that, okay, whatever I am doing, in everything that we do, we are looking for an external result. And it's important in many roles. But if you get fixated only on the external result, and if you don't get the external result, you think everything is pointless. Why am I doing this? But you see, when the external result is not coming, okay, the internal result of going closer towards Krishna is coming. And okay, this external result may not come. Let some other result come. Let me see. So Prabhupada was firm in his purpose of trying to share Krishna's message, but he was flexible in how he went about doing it. And whenever we feel disheartened, it is usually because uh, we have got caught in a lower purpose which is being thwarted. So Arjuna was disheartened before the Kurukshetra war, and uh, Yudhishthira was disheartened after the Kurukshetra. Because it was while functioning in the world, their purpose already set in. Why should we rule at the cost of so much bloodshed? But the point was not to rule, the point was to establish. So first Krishna through the Gita, and then Bhishma through the Shanti Parvana and Shatra Parvana instructions, raised the consciousness to show the bigger purpose. And so, so we need to stay focused on this purpose. And then, draw from the other person, this is what we do, and how would you see Krishna's role? That if we think Krishna is the cause of our suffering, that is a, we don't really know what the cause of suffering is. There's an oversimplification to say Krishna is causing our suffering. But Krishna is like the GPS. Even if we make a wrong turn, Krishna is there to, everything is not Krishna's plan, but everything is within Krishna's plan. Then Krishna, if Krishna is the cure for our suffering, yes, he is the ultimate cure, but sometimes in some other immediate cure may be required. Sometimes some, no immediate cure may work. If we see Krishna as our comforter, that means Krishna is with me and Krishna is giving me the strength to face the situation. So Srila Swami says that Krishna lifts a devotee out of the material ocean by giving the devotee the knowledge of how to come to him in that situation. Now, how to come to him means that that knowledge is sometimes like a street light which shows the whole way, sometimes it's only a piece of flashlight. Just to one step forward. And he keep taking one step, one step forward. Eventually, we find that whatever difficulties we are going through, they are not like a dungeon in which we are trapped, but they are like a tunnel which walk, we walk through to a brighter and better place which is closer to our Lord. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, are there any questions or comments? Thank you, Prabhuji, for a very nice class. Uh, one question I wanted to ask, like you talk about uh, influence, like you can give influence to come out of the situation, give, uh, giving you influence to come here. But in um, the morning lecture, we heard about, about the mind also, like how to handle the mind, how to um, like manage the mind, how to handle the situation. So I was just thinking, like, how the influence and the mind play the role, like, it is a more important to give a priority to influence to purify, and then automatically the mind will get purified in the senses. Okay. So how do the influence and mind interact? So we first try to purify the intelligence. 
Jeeva Goswami says in the Shatkandar verse that the sadhaka will stay on the spiritual platform by preaching. The Siddha will stay, stay on the spiritual platform by preaching. Siddha has natural love for the Lord. So because of the love, they will stay on the spiritual platform. But for us, our devotion is wavering. So this is what we should always keep in mind. Devotion is very important. And Sadhguru Shastra and Narishi are very important. So we could say that there is conviction of the intelligence and there is purification of the mind. But now among these two, conviction of the intelligence comes much faster. If we study, if we analyze, if we immerse ourselves in philosophy, we can get that conviction. Actually, uh, staying in material consciousness, pursuing sensual pleasure, that is something that we could talk about. That's not going to be in the last time. Now, even when we have that conviction, that doesn't necessarily mean that our mind is not pleasuring it. So, there are, there, it's a three-step process. There's conviction of the intelligence that comes by, by hearing. Then there is, there is engagement in bhakti. The engagement in bhakti is what has to come first, then there is purification. So, we have to convince our intelligence by regular scripture study, and then just that conviction is not enough. How do we engage in bhakti? And that, bhakti, that practice of bhakti gives us a connection with Krishna. That connection is gradually, it gives us a higher taste. Now, that higher taste comes up, it's even much better than that. Why should I be craving for these things? And then gradually the mind gets accustomed to it. So, the same way, with respect to this is the principle of desires, but we can apply the same three steps to different conditions also. Basically, in the world, we get distracted by two things the promise of pleasure and the threat of trouble. So, there are temptations and there are tribulations. There's two that hold us. So, conviction of intelligence is yes, in the world there will be difficulties, but Krishna is my ultimate share. Uh, my purpose is to stay connected with Krishna. The mind may, there's an English word, hyperventilate. Hyperventilate means, hey, this is terrible, this is the end of the world, this is terrible, how oh, is this happening? Such things come and go. Let me stay focused. With the conviction of intelligence, we engage in that. And again, the mind's tendency to make problems bigger than what they need to be. So that also goes down. And that purification of the mind that goes. So we need conviction of intelligence and engagement in bhakti. So that will cause gradually change in the mind. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the wonderful set of classes over here. I just want to, it's more of a comment than just a confirmation from you. So in the first class, we talked about the three pleasure, Adhyatmika, Adhyatmika, uh, Adhyatmika. And in the second class, we talked about the diligence and dependence. And in the third class, we covered obstacles. So I'm trying to relate all the three in the sense when something is in our control, we said we should put diligence. And then we are trying to put diligence and then we are faced with obstacles. They can come in the form of Adhyatmika, Adhigodhika, Adhigodhika, like that. So when such obstacles come, we, it seems like many times, if the obstacles were, were not there, you could do better service. You were trying to do something, and you know that if you had these obstacles not come, I would have been able to do a better service. But then your time goes in fighting these obstacles or trying to remove these obstacles itself. So, what I'm learning is that Krishna wants us to, by giving these obstacles, he's giving the service of fighting to remove those obstacles rather than reaching the goal itself. I'm, I'm just trying to see the mood that we should have when, when those obstacles come. Uh, So what is the mood when the obstacles come? At one level, like when Kunti Maharani is saying, <clears throat> uh, 
let's put it this way, if we consider four quadrants, there is uh, there are there is comfort or you could say freedom no, no obstacles, not comfort in the sense of luxury, but comfort with no obstacles. So we can say there is comfort and spirituality. So one quadrant is no comfort, no spirituality. Second quadrant is comfort, no spirituality. Third is spirituality, no comfort. Fourth is spirituality and comfort. So now for a steady practice of bhakti, we need to be situated in the fourth quadrant. And that's why Krishna, you see, he talks first of the four eight is it is material order. Kalpranaya sadhana, vinasha yuskita, dharma samsthapna, kaya sambhava mudhi. And then the next verse is spiritual order. Janma karma chame nitya, indum yoga chitta, tetva dukham puna janma, nanti mahati swachu. So this is the stable state. We need certain level of material comfort. Then we can grow spiritually. <clears throat> Suppose after this program, there is prasad. Is it before or after Swami? Or both? Both. <laughs> <laughs> but suppose if uh, after the class there was prasad. But suppose there was no guarantee there will be prasad. Then we will think, oh, I have to go, go and get prasad after the program. They have to cook with any plate for me, but then we're not able to focus. Then occasionally we might fast on Ekadashi or something like that. But regularly, that kind of uncertainty is a little difficult. So the point is that we need a certain level of comfort and spirituality to go together. This is a steady state. Now this no comfort, no spirituality is a totally miserable state. Comfort and uh, comfort but no spirituality. That is a illusory state. We feel good, but now it will last for very long. So now, if we see Kunti Maharaj, what is she praying? Let those obstacles come again. So if we have the third quadrant, you see here. No comfort, but spirituality. So what is going on over here? Is she actually praying that let Krishna will take my comforts? See, now the mood is there. If that is what is required for me to focus on you, I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to accept it in that. So for all of us, we need a certain level of material, material order or material stability or material comfort so that we can practice spiritual. And we should make the necessary endeavor to have that material stability. The three kleshas could mean that the material stability is going to and if the three pleasures are coming, we strive to counter the three pleasures as much as we can. But the point is that we don't make our spirituality dependent on the removal of the three pleasures. We strive to be in the fourth quadrant. So he says, I want comfort and then I want spirituality also. But if the comfort is going away, then in pursuing that comfort, I don't go to the second quadrant. So much that I give up my spirituality. Okay, so even if the comfort is not there, I will stay spiritual. Let me we consider one, two, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. You want to be third quadrant. Now, sometimes if the comfort and spiritual comfort is going away, we can get so obsessed with solving that material problem that we just give up our spirituality completely. Now, of course, we may have to adjust in particular material emergencies. We may reformulate how we practice our spirituality. But if we just give it up completely to go to the second quadrant, that's undesirable. So when the Bhagavad is saying that, okay, good thing, I'm ready to go here also. I'll still stay connected with you. So we can we can be willing to accept that sometimes in our spiritual life, we may be in the fourth quadrant. Where we may have we may have spirituality, but we may not have material comfort. But that doesn't mean that we think that spirituality is that state itself all the time. So that is where we are regularly, and we have to make some adjustments so that we may come to the for steadiness, we need the third quadrant. But if we make the being in the third quadrant of comfort and spirituality is a precondition for our spirituality, that's not it. 
and we see as soon as the pandavas won the kingdom or even ram won in lanka one of the first thing ram says is in bhishma he says provide abundant fruits and food for all the vandavas they were fighting for me for a long time and as i was poor i couldn't provide them then the devas come and uh, they thank ram for having killed ram this is what what can we do as you said so wherever these monkeys live let there never be a shortage of food so he arranges for them to come they have a spiritual purpose to serve ram and they are ready to accept discomfort even death for his sake but as soon as the order is destroyed ram arranges for them to come and same with the pandavas immediately immediately upon the issue of the throne he gives us a series of relief measures to take care of all the orphans the widows to take care of, of all the devastation that happened because of the war so the idea here is if if you want to put three classes together in the four quadrants that some sometimes we get into the quadrant where comfort goes away from us and at that time how do we say if we think that krishna's krishna should bring the comfort back to me that if we reduce our spirituality to the fourth quadrant then why am i not getting away is the krishna is not helping me as so a third quadrant is you know comfort and spirituality if we fixate too much on that then we will feel i can't be spiritual but you see jibril is not here even if i am here it's so gradually we have come to that level of comfort and spirituality but we are constantly caught in that lack of comfort and spirituality that's not going to work but occasionally when we go through that that's what i said the dark tunnel so our mood should be that yes i'm ready to walk through this tunnel when there are difficulties coming i need this quadrant i can't get it but i will try to come to this quadrant but in coming out of comfort i don't want to i am coming back to comfort I don't want to give up my spirituality. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So one last question. So. so thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ji Ki Jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Bye.